Good evening. Thank you for joining. Um, tonight's class <clears throat> was sponsored by uh, Benny Benzion Westreich, and this is in honor of his father's yard site that I think is tonight on Hay of. Harav Rabbi Yeshua, Ben Harav Rabbi Yosef Yoska. Allah wa shalom. May his neshama have a really, really great aliyah to the greatest of heights. May he channel a lot of brachas down to you and your family for all that you want and all that you need. For all the blessings both in the material and in the spiritual. Um... Tonight, and um, I want to thank I want to thank uh, you, Benny, for the both. He sponsored the shear. He also sponsored the CD. Big Yashu um, Koyach. Today is a special day. Tonight is a special night. It's the Holy Arizal's yard site, and that's a very, 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 very powerful time. We know how much the Holy Ari influenced and continues to influence Jewry, the Jewish people, forever and ever. Today is also unique and special. There is a big siyam today. The siyam on Sefer Mishneh Torah. For those who study Rambam every day, the Lubavitcher Rebbe instituted that people should learn Rambam Yomi, Rambam every day. And there's two cycles. One is a cycle for three years. We learn one parak a day, and the other cycle, which is the primary cycle, is to complete the entire Sefer Mishnah Torah of the Rambam every year by studying three prakim a day. So today, it takes a little bit less than a year. Today is, I think, the conclusion of the 38th um, machzor, repetition of study of Mishnah Torah by hundreds of thousands of Jews worldwide, and we begin the 39th Machzer, studying. The Sefer of the Rambam is called Mishneh Torah, because it's a review of the Torah. So therefore it would be appropriate tonight, in honor of Mishneh Torah, to discuss Mishneh Torah. But we're going to discuss a different Mishneh Torah. We're going to talk about the Mishnah Torah of Parsha's Sefer Devarim, because it happens to be that this week we begin the fifth book of Chumash, the, the reading in the shuls, we begin the fifth book, Sefer Devarim, Deuteronomy, and that Sefer, the Sefer Devarim, is called Mishnah Torah. Why is it called Mishnah Torah? Because it's a review on the Torah. A lot of Many, many of the mitzvahs that are me mentioned earlier that were taught by Hashem to uh, Moshe Rabbeinu at Sinai, at Har Sinai, and then again it was taught by the Abish there, um, and then by, uh, in, uh, by the Oal Mohe during the time when Hashem communicated to Moshe in the Mishkan during the 40 years. So then when Moshe got to Arvos Moav, and it was Rosh Chodesh Shvat, um, about 37 days before his passing, Moshe Rabbeinu begins to review the Torah. And he reviews many, many, many of the mitzvahs. He reviews many of... He reviews... He reviews many of the mitzvahs that... Um, he reviews many of the mitzvahs that were given earlier, Moshe reviews over here. So right in the beginning, so I want to talk about tonight of the significance of Sefer Mishneh Torah, which is Moshe Rabbeinu's review. So to begin, right in the beginning of the parsha, and, and, and again, we'll see, I mean, it's not necessarily applicable to the Rambam, but maybe it is, perhaps, because both of them share the same name, and Rambam is also meant to be a chazara, a review, and a codifier of all the laws of the Torah. So, um, in the beginning of Sefer Devarim, 
it says in Pasuk Gimel, right at the beginning, in verse number 3, Barbaim Shana was in 40 years, the 40th year from when they went out of Mitzrayim, Ba'ashte Asr Chodesh, in the 11th month, Be'achad Lachod, which is the month of Shvat, it's the 11th month from Chodesh, um, from Chodesh uh, Nisan, which is the first month, Be'achad Lachodesh, on the first day of the month, Diber Moshe al Bnei Yisrael, Moshe Rabbeinu spoke to the Jewish people, Kechol HaShetziva Hashem Oisei Aleim, like everything that God commanded Moshe to them. So what does it mean? What is this that Moshe, what is it referring to? These words, Moshe is now going to speak, El Bnei Yisrael, everything that God commanded. So we have two Pirushim over here. We have the Pirush of Rashi, and we have the Pirush of the Sephornu. Rashi and the Sephornu have different understandings. Both of them are Pashtanim, Pashtana means people who explain the Torah on the simplest of levels, on the level of, of pshat. And yet they have a different take on what are these words that Moshe Rabbeinu is now going to say at the 40, that, that, that is going to say now in, in Sefer Devarim. Rashi says it's divrei teichacha. It's words of rebuke. Moshe is rebuking the Jewish people. And Rashi goes on to explain that Moshe waited until this point to do so because you should not rebuke someone until before one's passing. The rebuke that a person will give to someone should only be done at the end of a person's life. That's when you should rebuke. And Rashi says there's many reasons why you shouldn't rebuke someone. And obviously, Moshe Rabbeinu rebuked the Jewish people when they made the eagle, so on and so forth. That's, that's an immediate reaction. But to go and sit down and give a general rebuke, and I would say a call of improvement and a rebuke to someone, uh, there's, there's reasons why you shouldn't do that until a person is about to move on to a different, uh, perhaps better place. So, but that's what Rashi says. So it comes out from Rashi that the, the Devarim, the words that we're talking about, is Divrei Teichacha, the words of rebuke. So Forno learns, Okay, it was after the Mesei Midbar passed away, all those who had to die in the desert. Diber Moshe Bnei Yisrael, Moshe spoke to who? To the Jewish people, Lebohe Aretz, to the next generation. It's coming to the land. Which, by the way, that emphasizes more that it shouldn't be a rebuke, because it's not, if you're emphasizing that the previous generation is gone and the new generation is here, they're not to be rebuked. They didn't sin. It was mainly the parents that sinned. But then he, ta- and he, and he continues, <laughs> like all that God commanded him. So it says, <laughs> So Moshe Rabbeinu reviewed the entire Torah. <laughs> he returned, he reviewed with them, Chazara <laughs> Satorah, a repetition and a Chazara on the entire Torah. This is what it means over here that Moshe is speaking to them at the 40 years. Okay? So we have two explanations on what are the devarim, what are the words that Moshe is now going to say. Rashi learns it's a rebuke. Ramban, and I'm sorry, Sephornu says, it's Mishneh Torah, it's a review of the Torah. Now one thing is for sure, that everybody agrees that in Sefer, in Sefer Devarim, in the book of Devarim, you can find both. You can find many psukim of rebuke. That's primarily the first few uh, parshios, Devarim, Veschanan, Ekev. There's a lot of Moshe repeating and telling over the stories of what happened. He, re- he reviews the story of the Meraglim. He reviews the Chet Egel, the sin of the golden calf. Various different things that Moshe reviews about what happened, which is all aspects of rebuke. And it's also clear that in Mishnah Torah, you also have a repetition of mitzvahs. Moshe reviews most of the mitzvahs. Now there are mitzvahs that are not reviewed. Ramban in his Agdam, in his introduction to Sefer Devarim, explains that the mitzvahs that were given to the Kohanim regarding Karbonos were not reviewed. He says, because Kohanim are good, are, are very meticulous, they're good listeners. You tell them once and they know already. They, you, don't have to, you don't have to review it with them. But the Bnei Yisrael, 
uh, they needed more than one, one they, they needed to be mazuras, they needed to be uh, you know, warned again and again so they will keep it. So you don't have a review of everything, but you definitely have a review. So it can't be that, that's, that there's a, an argument between Rashi and the Sephora, and what does it say in Sefer Devarim, when it's clearly stated what it says in Sefer Devarim, read the Chumash. It says both. And as it actually says in the Hakdama for Ramban, in the introduction of Ramban to Sefer Devarim, Ramban says, I'll read you the words in his introduction. He says, Nichla um, Lubo, let me, let me get to it. He says, um, Hasefer Azen Yona Yedua. This sefer is known. Shu Mishnah Torah. It's a review, a repetition of the Torah. Yevo be Moshe Rabbeinu Olav Ashalom Ledora Nechnas Baaretz. Moshe Rabbeinu was speaking to the generation that's going into the land. Rov Mitzvah Satora. Most of the mitzvahs of the Torah that the Jewish people will need. He doesn't bring, as mentioned earlier, he doesn't speak about the Karbanos because that's something that uh, he spoke to the Kahanim. The Kahanim are very careful, but for the Jewish people, he reviews with them. That's what he says. And then he says. Um, uh, uh, there is also there is also rebukes and there is some heavy duty um, frightening stuff that's going to scare them as punishment if they won't listen you have that in the end and then later he says also before he begins to be mevair the Torah before Moshe began reviewing the Torah he begins to rebuke them I'm telling them their sins in order, why? Not to chas v'shalom, put them down, but that they shouldn't, they should realize that God has a lot of patience and a lot of mercy. Because you see, Moshe is showing them how they sinned and yet they survived. So even though being a Jew is going to be tough, going into the land of Israel and keeping all the mitzvahs, especially for beginners who've never done them, and now they're going to have to take, especially in Eretz Yisrael, so many mitzvahs, it might be that they might be afraid that, not, that, 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 that they take on such a such a uh, monumental task, something so difficult. So Moshe had to kind of calm them and tell them, don't worry, you can do it. You see, you survived till now because Hashem is very patient. And, and okay. So you see clearly from the Ramban that it's a mixture of both. Then if so, what's the argument? Why is the Rashi saying one pirush and what are the words? And Sephora is saying something else. So you have to say, the question is, what is the ikr? What is the primary element of Eila Hadvarim? What do you see as the, as the main thing? According to Rashi, which is bringing it from the Safri, the main thing of, this, of these devarim, of these words, is the rebuke. And according to the Safarnu, the main element of Sefer devarim is a review of the mitzvahs. So it's a review of the mitzvahs. However, being that we have both these things, and again, two opinions regarding to, teichach, or regarding to devarim, whether it's teichacha, uh, a rebuke, or whether it's a Mishnah Torah, it's a review of the Torah, um, it, would, it, would, it would seem that there must be a similarity between these two, two, these two ideas. In other words, if, if there can be two pirushim in the word devarim, one word devarim, which can mean, it can mean rebuke, or it can mean um, a mitzvah, a mitzvah review, you have to say that there is a, meaning Mishnah Torah, a review of the Torah, it must be that there is a similar content to the, re, to, the, to, to the idea of rebuke and the idea of repetition of Torah. So that's what we want to discuss tonight. What is the essential component that is the same, we can say, in repetition of the Torah and also in the idea of rebuke? So to understand that, let's first get a better understanding in the general idea that Sefer Devarim is Mishneh Torah. So, the Gemara tells us, the Gemara says something interesting. The Gemara says that Mishneh Torah is Moshe Mepi Atzmoi Amram. The Mishneh Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu said it. Moshe Mepi Atzmoi, the Gemara Mesechtes Megillah. 
Daf Lamed Aleph. The Gemara says in Mesechtis Megillah, over here, Lamed Aleph Amad Beis, Amad Abaya Abaya says, Lo Yishanu Elo Be'oh. Now the, it's interesting. The Gemara is not talking about the entire. The Gemara is not talking about the entire Mishnah Torah, the entire book of Devarim. The Gemara is speaking about specifically the curses. The re, and the end in, in, in Parshas Kisavo. Moshe Rabbeinu lists a whole number, a whole number, a whole list of curses that are going to happen Chas v'shalom, if Jews won't keep the Torah. So Amar Abai Abaya says that There's certain laws that apply to the curses that are in the book of Ayikra, in the book of Leviticus. But the curses that are in the Mishnah Torah, you can, there's a different halacha. You can, you can make an interruption. My time, what's the reason? I'm not going to go into that halacha, what the halacha is. But there's a difference between the, the klolis over there because um, uh, there's one difference, I'm not going to go through that difference. And the second thing is, the first one in Torah's Kahanim, Moshe Mepihagavura Omram. Moshe said it in the words of God. He received, he's giving over from the mouth of the Almighty. Mepihagavura means from the mouth of the Almighty. But, Vahalalu, but the ones in Mishneh Torah, in this Sefer, um, that what? Moshe Mepihatzmam Omram. Moshe Rabbeinu said it on his own. Chiddush, that Moshe Rabbeinu said Mishneh Torah, it's not, seemingly, it's not coming from God. Mishneh Torah is Moshe Rabbeinu's own words. The, the Gemara is using the term Moshe Mepi'atzmai Amra, that Moshe said it on his own. The Gemara uses that term only for the klolis, for the curse, which is Pashas Kisavo. The curses of Mishnah Torah, Moshe Mepiatz Mamam. In the Zohar, however, <coughs> and uh, there is, it says it regarding the entire Sefer of Mishnah Torah. The Zohar says, Mishnah Torah, the entire Mishnah Torah, Moshe Mepiatz Mamam. Moshe said it on his own. Uh, the Arachayim HaKadosh actually, in the beginning of Sefer Devarim also seems to be, says that, uh, Vafilu, he says it right in the first piece of Arachayim. Vafilu ma'ashe chazaru, he brings what the Gemara says, Kalolo she b'mishne toire, Moshe me piatz mamam, Moshe said it on his own. And he says, Vafilu ma'ashe chazaru, pidish mamre Hashem ha'kodmim, even when he repeated the earlier uh, words of God, loin etztav ha'asos ken, he wasn't commanded to do so, elo me'atz mo'i chazar advarim, it's his own. So he's learning that Mishnah Torah completely, the entire Mishnah Torah is Moshe Mepi'atzmam Amra. Moshe said it on his own. Um, I mentioned earlier that today is the yard site of. Hold on. Oh, no, what did I do with that safer? I mentioned that today is the yard site of the Arizal. So I'd like to also quote from the Arizal, just in honor of the yard site of the Holy Ari tonight. So the Arizal also says, Tama mitzvis la Arizal, Pashis Hazinu. And the Tamim mitzvis of the Arizal, he says, Seifet Dvarim u Mishneh Torah. Seifet Dvarim is Mishneh Torah, v'choyzer v'koylo. And he repeats, Kol ma'asheh b'chumashem arishaynim. Everything that is in the first chumashem, oh, I'm sorry. So the Arizal is, is, is what's it called again, not saying regarding that Moshe Rabbeinu said it on his own. On his own. He's just characterizing Sefer Mishnah Torah as a repetition. And it's included in it, everything that's stated in the earlier, in the earlier Chumash. Okay. In any case, a summary, yeah. It summarizes all of the Torah, it's a conclusion, and it's a summary of everything that was there before. So we really need to understand that. What does it mean when we say Moshe Rabbeinu said it on his own? The Rambam tells us in Hilchus Yesodei HaTorah, in the laws of the fundamentals of Torah, that if a person says that there is even one small part of Torah that is not given by God, that was not dictated by God, but Moshe said it on his own, 
Even if he says it on one os, on one, not only a word, even on one letter of Torah, one letter of Torah that that does not come from God, doesn't come from Hashem, then that person is a heretic. He's a non-believer. We believe the entire Torah from the base of Bereshis until the Lamed of the Eine Kol Yisrael comes from Hashem. It's all divine. So what does it mean when the sages say, and as again, the Gemara says it narrowly only on the Klolos of Mishneh Torah. But, and, and by the way, the Rashi, when Rashi over there says, what does it mean by the Klolos of, Divrei Torah, of, of Mishneh Torah, the Klolos that are in Devarim, and where do you see the difference at the, from the first ones to the second ones? He says, because when you, when you look at the first ones, Rashi says, you see like this, Moshe Mepia, Gevura Amram Rashi and Mesechtas Megillah, again, Daf Lamed Aleph Amad Beis, Venasa Shliach, Moshe Rabbeinu became an emissary, became a Shliach, Loimar to say, Kach Amra Liyach Kaddush Baruch Hu. This is what God said. So basically, Rashi is saying that in, in, in the other book, books, until Mishneh Torah, or and the, including the curses that there are in Parshas Vayikra, in Sefer Vayikra, in Parshas B'chu Kosai, Moshe Rabbeinu is coming and he's telling us, quote, this is what God says. So he's quoting, he's actually repeating the exact <coughs> words that Hashem said. Why? Because Moshe is saying it in first person. Moshe says, I will punish you, I will bring upon you this, this, this problem and this, this, this plague and that plague. Now, Moshe is not doing that. God is the one doing it. How can Moshe say, I will do that? It's not chas v'sholem attributed to Moshe. It's because Moshe is not at all telling us. It's like if I come to you and, I, and, I, and I'm repeating a quote that I heard from someone else. If I say that, you know, I heard from, you know, Yankel, uh, that he said to me that I'm going to the airport. So that doesn't mean I'm going to the airport. I'm saying to you that he said that I'm going to the airport. So even though I'm saying um, I'm just giving you his words. So when it says over there, I will bring the plagues and so on and so forth, it's he's saying it in the name of God. Oh, that means he's saying it, because God said to him, Hashem said to him, go tell the Jewish people so and so. Misha Yechoilus Lasis, Rashi says, the one that's capable to do. Aval the Mishneh Torah, but when in Sefer Devarim, in Mishneh Torah, again, Rashi is referring to the Klolois in Parshas Kisavai, the curses in Mishneh Torah. If, over there he doesn't say, I will do it. It says, Yakacha Hashem. The words are, Hashem will smite you. Yad Beik Hashem Becha, Hashem will attach to you this problem and this plague and so on and so forth. So you see that Moshe is speaking about what God is going to do, but it's his words, he's not quoting. Okay? So it would seem to be saying that what? Clear. That this is Moshe's own thing. That's what it, it looks like. That it's Moshe Rabbeinu saying, but how does it fit with what we told you and we said mentioned earlier from the uh, Rambam that if someone says uh, that uh, Torah, even one letter of the Torah, including Sefer Devarim, doesn't come from Hashem, uh, that's heretical belief. So what does it mean? So let's see, take a look in Tosfus. Tosfus says, Moshe me'atzmoi omram. Moshe said it on his own. Give me the phone. Um, Rashi says, Beruach, I'm sorry, Tosfo says over here in Mesechtis uh, Megillah, Uberuach HaKodesh. When it says Moshe said it on his own, Tosfo explains it means with Ruach HaKodesh. That means with divine inspiration. Ruach HaKodesh means, basically, that God is speaking through him. When a person is speaking with Ruach HaKodesh, it means they're not telling you their own thoughts, their own opinions, they're, they're, insp they're inspired by a divine download, by a divine communication. They're, commu they're channeling something. That's what Ruach HaKodesh is. Ruach HaKodesh is a form of prophecy. It's a form of nevuah. Generally, it's explained that Ruach HaKodesh, how Ruach HaKodesh is a lesser, how Ruach HaKodesh is a lesser form of nevuah, but it still is nevuah. And the same is also in the Zohar. Let me quote to you a passage of the Zohar. Here. This, when the Zohar says, um, Tochazi, this is a, a Zohar in, um, 
Chele Gimel Dafresh Samach Hey. Iksiv Moshe Yedaber Moshe spoke Velakim Yanenu Bekol Vitanin. And what does it mean? Bekol Bekolish Al Moshe. What does it mean? Bahu Koil Di Ochid Be. It's the voice that became attached to Moshe Al Kol Shar Nevi'im above all the other prophets. That means Moshe Rabbeinu had an extra dosage of channeling higher than all the other prophets. That, that Moshe Rabbeinu was a conduit for the Devar Hashem that was flowing through him. Begin the Iyu is Achid al Kulu, because he is unified with God more than anyone else. Bahu Koil, and he was unified more than all the other prophets. Bahu Koil in that sound, in that voice. Dargi Allah, that very high level. And then, how do you know that this, but maybe this applies to the rest of the Torah? He's talking about Moshe Yedaber by Har Sinai. When Moshe was speaking by Har Sinai, but maybe when Mishneh Torah, Moshe is not using that voice that he's connected to. Maybe he's using his own voice. So then, but the Zohar continues, V'amar Reb Shimon, and Reb Shimon says, Taninon we learned, Kololo Yishe B'Torah's Kahanim, the curses of Torah's Kahanim, um, Moshe Mepi Agvura Amra, Moshe said it in the name of, from the Almighty, but Shebe Mishneh Torah, but the ones from Mishneh Torah, Moshe Mepi Atzmai Amra, Moshe said it on his own. So the, the Zohar explains, Reb Shimon says, My Mepi Atzmai, what does it mean on his own? V'chisal kedaitach, will you think? Us ze'ira ba'iraisa, even a tiny letter of the Torah, Moshe Amar le Migarme, Moshe said it on his own? Elishapir hu, but the real explanation is, it doesn't say his It was aroused by himself. from his mouth, meaning to say What does that mean? That voice. It doesn't say that it was his, his ideas. It was just from his mouth. It came through his mouth, which is what. It's from that coil the yuachid bay, that voice which is not his. It's a divine voice, a godly call that Moshe Rabbeinu is unified, and that's and that's what it is. Okay, if we are going to say, and obviously we have to, we have to say that that mepi atzmo on his own doesn't mean on his own. So we're saying that Mishnah Torah is also. A divine communication. So then we're back to a question. So what really then is going to be the difference of the book of Devarim, the last, the fifth book, compared to the earlier four? In the earlier four, it also came through Moshe's mouth. And it was what? Clearly, Ruach HaKodesh. Nevuah, prophecy, Ruach HaKodesh, the highest level of Nevuah. And yet, and we say Mishnah Torah is different. This is Mepi Atzmo. Moshe saying it on his own. And we just explained that mipiatzmo means also, like Toisva says, Ruach HaKodesh. That's, it, it's, it's through a, a, a divine spirit. Like the Zohar says that the voice that he was unified with came, was coming through him. So what difference then? Then there's no difference between mipiatzmo and, and the Sefer Devarim and the others. There's another Gemara, the Gemara Masech des Brachas, I think, in Dav Chav Beis. The Gemara differentiates again the book of Devarim and the rest of it, and the first five, the first four books. What does the Gemara say? The Gemara is talking about if you darshan smuchim. Darshaning smuchim means if you can expound and derive certain halachos from looking at different parshios that they are placed one next to each other. When two parshios are juxtaposed one next to each other, I have to say that I enjoyed saying juxtaposed. That's no good. We read these English chumashim and they come up with these really f- interesting words. Juxtaposed. Okay. Um, in any case, the question is when, when um, you have two parshios that are stated one next to each other, can you derive certain halacha, certain ideas from one parsha being next to the other parsha and say God is putting these two together for a reason? 
So there's an argument, there's different opinions, two opinions, whether we darshan smuchin or we don't darshan. The reason we shouldn't darshan, we shouldn't derive, we shouldn't take it as here to show us a message and therefore derive a certain halacha and idea from it, is because of the idea that we know that the Torah was not placed in chronological order. Ein mugdim amucha b'Torah. So there's no chronological order. Therefore, it's, it would seem like it's, what it's really saying is that it's kind of random. And if it's random, you can't learn out from one being next to the other because Isaiah does. It's not, it's not following a specific organized order. If it was put organized in a specific intentional way, so then there's a reason God wants you to darshan it. That's why he put it this way next to the other one. He wants you to derive something from it. But if it's not based on any specific order, so therefore you can't learn now. So the Gemara says, that is that even the, even the one who says that we don't expound, we don't derive things from halachas being put, from parshios being put one next to, the, next to the other, but in Mishnah Torah we do. In Sefer Devarim, everybody agrees, we will learn out from one parsha put next to the other. Why? Why in Mishnah Torah we do? So the Ravin, one of the Rishonim, explains, and he says that the reason why we do the Mishnah Torah, he says, because, because Mishnah Torah is Moshe Mepi Atzmai. Moshe said it on his own. And since Moshe said it on his own, so then we don't say the rule, Ein Muktem Mucher B'Torah, there's no first and later. That applies to the utterly divine part of Torah, the first four books of the Torah, which is on a purely divine level. Over there, we have no, there is no understanding of the order. So we can't derive from things being put in different the things. It's, it's just totally beyond us. But in the book of Mishnah Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu put certain, this parsha next to that parsha for a reason. And that's why we can, we can darsh it. We can learn out from it. So here we get back to the same question. We just explained that Mipiatsmo doesn't mean that he's saying his own thing. Here too he's channeling. He's communicating, he's, he's delivering the word of God. It's not, his own, it's not his own words. And if that's the case, so what makes Mishnah Torah different, the book of Devarim, different than the first four? So the answer to that is as follows. In general... Why was the Torah given through Moshe to begin with? Number one, why did it have to be given through somebody? I mean, I mean obviously by Har Sinai, Hashem tried speaking to the Jewish people directly. And the Jewish people said, it's too much, too much. And they asked Moshe to go in between. Hypothetically, could God have communicated the Torah to the Jewish people not through a human being? Probably not. But if Hashem has to choose a human being, why is he choosing Moshe? What's the idea behind it? Say Moshe, because Moshe is the biggest tzaddik. Yeah, but, but let's understand that at a deeper level. See, Torah essentially is impossible for humans to comprehend. And the reason is, the sages tell us that Torah, alpayim shana kadma Torah va'olam. The Torah precedes the world 2,000 years. Which obviously we understand it's silly to say that the Torah just was, that it means 2,000 years in time. Because before the world is created, there is no time. Time started with the, with, with the creation. So 2,000 years needs to be understood that the sages means that the Torah is on a level that's way beyond creation way beyond the universe, including the spiritual universes. Why it mentions 2,000 is, is, is something that, that, that should be explained another time. But, but, but we understand, it means that the Torah is beyond the world. If it's beyond the world, it means it's beyond humans. It's beyond angels also. It's beyond human intelligence. Why? Because we understand that the Torah is Chachmasay Uretzayinay Shalakadish Baruch Hu. 
The Torah is God's wisdom and the Torah is God's will. God is infinite. The Rambam says, Hu echad. Hashem and His wisdom are one. So just like we understand, Kiloi we can never grasp God. No one can even think of grasping God. As the Zohar says, Leis machshava tfisa bay, there is no thought that can grasp Him. And he and his chachma are one, and he and his ratzon are one, he and his will and he and his wisdom are one. So Torah is essentially untouchable, unknowable, un, un, and definitely uninternalizable and undigestible. It's impossible. Because it's, because it's godly. For that reason, in order for the Torah to come down, it requires the concept of a mamutza. A mamutza means a middleman. A mamutza means a mediator. Similar to the concept of a translator. When you have two entities that have a problem that they can't communicate one with the other, two people, let's say, the differences between one and the other is vast and they can't communicate. Let's say the gap that exists between them is a language gap. They don't speak the same words. So generally with a human, other, any other human being that speaks the same language, I can communicate. But if I have a, this gap or this barrier and this, 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 that, that we don't speak the same language, I can't begin to communicate. So I need to find a translator. Today's days, we can do Google Translate. So Google can be the translator. But what's the translator? Generally, the idea of a translator is that the translator has to speak both languages. Translator that's going to translate from English to Chinese has to be someone who speaks both English and Chinese. And they can translate from English to Chinese and Chinese to English, back and forth. So when we're speaking about translating an utterly divine Torah into the human mind, into, the worldly, in, into worldly intelligence, from God's intelligence. And over here we understand that the gap that exists is much greater than two people that can't speak the same language. Because if you don't speak a certain language, you'll practice, you'll learn, you can learn the language. It's not like it's an impossible task. You're not so far from speaking Chinese. If you were given a job for $2 million a year, uh, you would learn Chinese pretty quickly. To learn it in three months, you would already start speaking a little bit. And, then in, and, in, and in a year from now, you might be fluent in Chinese if it was so important. Right? So it's not too far from us to be able to speak. But to, be, to have a divine intellect is impossible for us. Because we're finite. As much as we will expand our mind, and as much as we will learn and study and, 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 and squeeze our brain and toil with the, the greatest effort, we will never have a divine mind. We will always be a human mind. We will be a deep mind maybe, a great mind, but we will never be a divine mind. So it is an infinite gap. So obviously we understand we need the mediator. But who can mediate? So the only one who can mediate is a being, just like to mediate from English to Chinese, it has to be someone who lives in both worlds, in the English world and in the Chinese world. You need to have a human being who lives in both worlds. On the one hand, he's of earth, but on the other hand, he is of heaven. And that's Moshe. Because Moshe Rabbeinu is called Ish Elohim. He is a godly man. There's actually a, a medrash that says, that Moshe Rabbeinu was, his upper half was Elohim, was divine, and his lower half was human, was an ish. So Moshe, and, and what does that mean really? What does that really mean? The divinity of Moshe Rabbeinu, that Moshe Rabbeinu was beyond, he's outside of the limitations of the world. He's outside of the definitions of a definitive creature, of an existence. Of how can, why is he that way? Because Moshe Rabbeinu, it says in Hasidus, it says in Kabbalah, 
It says in Chumash, but Chassidus and Kabbalah explain it. Moshe Rabbeinu, because of the unique neshama that he had, he obviously had a very, we'll speak about his neshama in a moment, but Moshe Rabbeinu had a very, very unique neshama, where he says about himself, v'nachnu, him and his brother Aaron, v'nachnu ma, and we are what? That means Moshe Rabbeinu had the deepest subservience, much deeper than subservience, nullification, abnegation to Hashem, so much so that Moshe Rabbeinu had zero beingness. In other words, Moshe Rabbeinu's bittle to the Eberstu was such, that's not like even like Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu said about himself, I am very small. I am dust and ashes. That means feeling extremely, extremely insignificant. David HaMelech said about himself, I am a worm. Anochi Telas, I am a worm. But both David and Avram Avinu could not get out of somethingness. As far as they went, they remained something because they're, 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 they, they have an identity. They're something. Moshe Rabbeinu crossed the barrier from somethingness into nothingness. When you, what does it mean going into nothingness? Where you cease to be and therefore the limitations and boundaries of in, 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 What do I mean you cease to be? You cease to be a something and you become just included in the all-embracing reality of the Eberster. You have no existence. Complete transparency. To the point where you don't exist, your existence is nullified in him. The bitl of Moshe. So realize, this is the total opposite of being so great. This is losing your existence completely. No other human being besides Moshe Rabbeinu. And also the super biggest tzaddikim, whose neshamas are from Olam Atzilus and higher, it's only these neshamas have that ability to become so nothing that the only reality that is in them is, is God. And from all of them, Moshe is in the highest level. So his bitl is a bitl of ma, non-existence, non-beingness. And in that sense, Moshe Rabbeinu is not part of the universe. He's not part of creation. Because when God creates something, He creates it to be a something. In your beingness, you have different definitions and that your definitions are your boundaries, and in those boundaries you are infinitely separated from the one who has no boundaries and no definitions, which is the Abish. But a being who is so subservient and not, and not in front of the Abish, experiences, not himself, experiences only God. In other words, his entire consciousness is pervaded by God, not by himself. And therefore the infinite can reside in Moshe's neshama. But on the other hand, Moshe Rabbeinu is also, he also has his feet in the ground. He's also a human. And in while he is human, he is the most perfect human being possible. As the Rambam refers to Moshe Rabbeinu, Shleimus Hanifchar, he's the, he's the choicest of Mina Nishi of the human race. That means that his when Moshe Rabbeinu descends or, or, or is a, 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 uh, a creation, then he is the most perfect creation. Like we see, that Moshe Rabbeinu also had a perfection of beingness. What I'm saying is, Moshe Rabbeinu straddles being and non-beingness. In his non-beingness, he's not human. He's divine. He's He's nullified to the divine. He's included in the divine. On the other hand, he is, when he is a being, he is the most perfect being. That's what we say about Moshe Rabbeinu physically. The Gemara learns out that in order, that a Navi needs to have perfections from all sides in order to be a, 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 to be a Navi. Including being wealthy. A Navi needs to be wealthy, he needs to be strong, he needs to be... Uh, and we all learn it out from Moshe. Because if there's a lack, and you're not perfect. But it, the Gemara also says about Moshe Rabbeinu that he was 10 cubits tall. Now to, let's, let's make that uh, compared to the average regular human being. The average human being is 3 cubits tall. That's including the head. So Moshe Rabbeinu's height was triple. Could have been in the NBA, huh? So Moshe Rabbeinu. So, 
It's interesting that we accept that, that the Medrash means that literally Moshe Rabbeinu was 10 cubits tall. That's about 15 feet. Whatever it is. But the reason why he was physically that way, if the Medrash, if the Gemara means in the physical sense, which why should we say not? But if that it, that, that it means that Moshe was so tall, it's because he, within creation, he's the most perfect creation, most perfect human being. So he's taller than everyone else. Within, but at the same time, he's also about, that's interesting. In Tehillim it says, Tfila la ish It's one of the one of the one of the psalms that which are attributed to Moshe Rabbeinu. So it says about Moshe Rabbeinu that Tfila a prayer to Moshe ish elokim. So in that by calling Moshe Rabbeinu both Moshe and ish elokim, we're actually referring to these two entities of Moshe. Ish elokim, I mentioned earlier, half is elokim, the other half is ish. But it is explained, the truth is that even Ish Elohim doesn't really tell us the true godless, the true greatness, the true transcendent, transcendence of Moshe. Because the name of Elohim represents divine divinity, but limited divinity. Because Elohim is the source of nature, Hateva. Elohim is Gematria 86, which is the Gematria of Hateva. So it's the divine already contracting itself to be a source for creation. We know that the real transcendental expression of God is Yudke Vavke, which is the tetragrammaton, which expresses God as He's completely beyond time and space. So Isha Lokim, He's a godly man, is still, limit, is still limiting Him. The other name, Moshe, is actually speaking of a much higher level than Isha Lokim. Moshe, why was He called Moshe? Because she pulled him out of the water. She pulled him out of the water. So in Kabbalah it says that Moshe Rabbeinu's neshama, Moshe's soul, is derived from the water. From the spiritual level of water that's called Alma de Eskasia, the most concealed and hidden levels of the divine that are beyond Elohim, that are so high. It says in Kabbalah, the idea Shema, which is the name of Yudke Vavke, which is 26, but with the Milo is 45. That's why he says about himself, Anachnu Ma, I am what? Because when you take Yud Kevavke with the inside letters, you get 45. That power, that's the transcendent, that's infinite. So Moshe Rabbeinu comes from that world. It says in, in um, Sefer Hakana from Rabbi Nechunya ben Hakana, it's a Sefer of Kabbalah, the earliest Kabbalah Svar. It says there were two Nishamis that are completely outside of the current system of existence. It says in, that we know that we are now in the second Shemitah. There are, it says there are seven Shemitahs. Our current system of existence is the second Shemitah. The first Shemitah is some kind of a primordial existence. So all the Shamas that we have today are from the current system. By Moshe Rabbeinu, it says, Minamayim Mishisuhu. She pulled him out, meaning spiritually, he was pulled out and plucked from a complete different system of existence that infinitely transcends the universe and all of its limitations and all spiritual worlds. Who's the other Neshama? Chanoch. Chanoch, who ascended to heaven, very, very, very sublime soul. And Moshe Rabbeinu, that's what it says in Sefer Verum Nechunya Ben Akana. Moshe and Hanoich are two Nishamas men Ashmita Rishayna. So, what does that tell you? Now, Moshe Rabbeinu is utterly bottled to Hashem. He's beyond being a being. But on the other hand, he's also a human being. He's both. You also see the, this combination in Moshe and his prophecy. On the one hand, we know that Moshe Rabbeinu was a higher prophet, greater than all other prophets. No one can no one compare to Moshe. On the other hand, it says that what? That Moshe Rabbeinu was, when he prophesied, all other Nevi'im would fall to the ground and lose their physical, that lose their physical bearings. But Moshe Rabbeinu was able to maintain his physicality. He would stand in his place and and and, and God would communicate. He received it with his body. So you see, at the same time that he's otherworldly, he's also worldly. And that's what we meant earlier, that we need to have a, a, a mediator, a perfect mediator between the, 
the infinite, between the ain't self, between the, between the divine and creation, is Moshe Rabbeinu. And that's the reason why Moshe Rabbeinu was the one who communicates the Torah. <clears throat> because Moshe Rabbeinu is able to receive from God himself. How is he receiving it from God? He's receiving it from the Abishter himself because he is, as we said earlier, Elohim, or even deeper, he's Moshe, in Amayim, he's from that Alma Discassia, from the concealed existence, he's from that transcendental existence, which is Ein Sof, from there he can receive directly from Hashem. Over there, he and Hashem are completely, he's nullified Hashem, so therefore included in, in, in the divine, and he can receive the infinite truths of Hashem. Hashem's mind can, can, is one with his mind. And from there, but he has to communicate it to us. We're humans. So, but since Moshe Rabbeinu was also a human being, made out of physical flesh and blood, Moshe had to eat, the 40 days in the Midbar, he didn't eat, but when he was down here, he is functioning like a regular human being. He was able to communicate the Torah into the finite, tangible, and limited brains of, of, of human beings. Okay, that's the idea of why we need to have motion. Now, here is something, whenever we speak about an intermediary, like we're talking about Moshe, we realize that there's two types of intermediaries. Two types, when we say a mamutza, there's two, two, two ways where something can be a mamutza. When something is passed from one level to another level through a, 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 a mediation process, there are two manners in which it could be passed through. One way it can, it can flow is in a way that it's only passing, but it's not being absorbed by the mediator. It's only passing through. Another way is that it goes from point A, it descends into B, it gets processed and unified and internalized in B, and then from B, it's communicated to C. So again, what would be the difference? In the first case, it's going directly from A to C, but it's, it's just funneling through B. A is passing it through B to C but it's not changing in B. Another way is, it goes from A to B, changes, becomes one with B, and therefore changes in B, and from B it gets passed down to C. That's called, the difference is, Bederech Mavir, Mavir means it's passing through, or Bederech Hislapshos, or in a matter of being enclosed. When something is enclosed, it means it has to be fitted and it therefore changes. Mara means it's passing through. Let me give a physical example, a difference between the two. Any idea that exists, any concept, when you study the concept and you grasp it in your mind, automatically, once it went into your mind, and then you like the idea, and you will teach it to your friends, when you will teach it to your friends, it will be the idea, but it will be the idea as you understood it. You can have two people sitting by the same shear, both of them going home excited about an idea, both of them understanding the idea, and then both of them repeat the idea, but it's very different coming out. And it's actually good when it's that way, as long as they're both understood. Because every person has different ideas, everybody's mind is shaped differently. <clears throat> the same idea, one person, based on all the other information that they've understood before, the way their brain is carved out, the way they understand, understand it <clears throat> in this manner, and that's how, it, it's the same concept, but the concept now is colored through the knowledge and understanding of this individual. It gets tainted. And the other person, because of their knowledge and because of their understanding, takes the idea differently. Two people can learn the same Rashi and both really learn the Rashi well and then give it over. It's completely different. Because of the, of the way they, their minds are thinking, the way they understand it. 
So intellect. So, but then there's the pure idea before it enters this person's mind or that person's mind. Into the mind, when it conceives the idea, processes it. And therefore changes it. Or another example. When a concept excites you emotionally. What does that mean? That the concept, the idea, descended into your emotions. When your emotions receive that information, that idea, <clears throat> the emotions, it changes. It's no more purely intellect, it's now an emotional energy. Because it went, it's, 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 it's a concept, but the concept has now taken on an emotional form and the characteristics of emotion. It changes. But now let me give you another, now let me give you another example, different. You know a concept, you understand something, but you want to pass it on to someone else and that you can't talk to them for whatever reason. So you're going to write it down. So you take a pen and a paper and you write down the concept. You're, let's say you're writing down the share that you're hearing right now. So you're taking these concepts and the idea. Now, it's passing through out. In order for it to end up on the paper, <clears throat> it's going to go through your arm. And not just your arm, it's going to go through your fingers. Let me ask you, and it's going to go through the pen. Does your hand and does the pen change the idea because it's going through the pen and your arms and your finger? Is it changing? It's not changing. It has to go through the pen because if it doesn't go through the pen or it doesn't go through your, your, your fingers, your arm, <clears throat> it will never translate from a, from a concept in your mind to, 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 physical, to a physical appearance on a paper. In order for it to come from place number A to place number C, in this case place number C is a physical form to be written of physical letters, your mind can't do that. Your hands can do that. So it has to travel from your mind, through your hand, through your fingers, down. But your hand and your fingers aren't changing it. That's the difference. When you're taking an idea into your seichel, your seichel is changing it. When you're taking an idea from your seichel to your emotions, your emotions are changing it. Why? Because each level, it's being internalized, it's being enclosed. And as it's being enclosed, it changes in that enclosement. Even though it's the same idea, but it, it gets filtered. And we might say it gets edited. As it descends, it gets edited. The, the, um, the passing of a concept through your hand, the hand doesn't edit it. The fingers don't change it. It's only passing through. So that's the difference between the two ways things can come. Passing or being enclosed. Once we understand that, now let's take a look at the difference between Sefer Mishneh Torah and the first four books of the Chumash. Both of them were passing through Moshe Rabbeinu. Because if it doesn't go through Moshe Rabbeinu, then it's impossible that us humans, us, you know, would be able to have any relationship to God's wisdom. So it has to go through Moshe. As we said earlier, Moshe contains both elements, and therefore we can pass it down to us. But here's the difference. The first five, the first four Svarim, Bereshis, until until, um, until uh, Devarim, including Bamidbar, those four books were coming through Moshe, and Moshe was just like a pencil, penning God's words. Moshe was like Hashem's hands and Hashem's fingers writing it down. Moshe Rabbeinu did not in any way alter it in any way to his human thinking. It was left in its complete divine form, the only thing was, it was brought down into our physical range that we can read it, hear it in physical words. So he passed it down into this physical range, realm. Sefer Mishneh Torah was, a re it was said, Beruach HaKodesh. It's again communicated by God, but it's communicated to him. He internalizes it with his mind, Therefore, it becomes absorbed now in human thinking and an understanding. Of course, the most sublime understanding of Moshe Rabbeinu. And then from there, it's passed on to us. So in a sense, you would say, 
that Sefer Devarim is downgraded. It's also godly, but it's downgraded. Because the rest of the Torah remains in its purely divine state. It's not diluted in Moshe Rabbeinu's mind. It's purely in its divine state. Mishneh Torah became what? Is diluted because it goes into Moshe and from Moshe it passes down to us. So then the question is, so why did Hashem do that? Why did Hashem then make one safer in Torah to be diluted? Why didn't Hashem, according to that it comes out that there's only a chisarin. There is a, there is something lacking in Mishneh Torah over the rest of the Torah. The rest of the Torah is more divine because it doesn't have the fingerprints of any human, even Moshe Rabbein. Um, the, the, it was untouchable. It's not altered. Mishta Torah is already changed. Even though it's godly, but it's changed. Funneled through the mind, processed through the mind, transformed through the mind of Moshe. So you have to say, however, that there is a mile in Mishta Torah. And the truth is it's a big mile, a very big quality. The reason why Mishta Torah was transformed that way and transmitted that way is for one reason. Because the objective of Torah is that Torah ideas and God's thoughts and God's intellect should be absorbed and should become our intelligence. If the entire Torah would have been only would have been communicated to Moshe like the first books, if the entire Torah from A to Z would have been given just where Moshe Rabbeinu was acting just as a funnel, without in any way impressing him, his self onto the Torah, then even though we would have the words of the Torah, we would have the words, we can read it, what we would be reading in Torah would not be divine Torah. What we would be reading in Torah would be human understanding of a divine of a divine script. Would we be getting the divinity of it? Would we be crunching in our mind or absorbing or digesting in our mind godly ideas? No. It's like an example. If I, I, I don't know if this is a good example, but maybe it's pretty close. If I was to come and give you right now a phrase, open up just a random book on quantum physics, opened up to page 367 and read you a paragraph on quantum physics that's written for people that have been studying quantum physics already for 10 years. It would be mumble jumble. It would mean nothing to you. If I take out now a book of the Arizal and I read you a passage of pure Kabbalah at a middle of the way, it would mean nothing. I mean, you would, we would understand it like a chicken looking at, 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 at Mount Everest, you know, and has an appreciation of what the Mount Everest is. You know, there's grass on it, there's maybe he can find kernels there. That, that's what it means to him. It doesn't see the, the, this, that we're looking at something so magnificent, the tallest mountain in the world. He has no appreciation of tall and of a mountain. What he's seeing is what a chicken sees in it. Us looking at the Torah is infinitely less than a chicken looking at the mountain. We have zero. So we wouldn't be getting the divine in it. We would be reading Aleph page. We would be reading a story and maybe the laws, but we wouldn't see the divinity in the laws. It's for that reason that the Abishter made one safer in the Torah, Mishnah Torah, that he tells, he gives it to Moshe in a way that he wants Moshe to process it. Once Moshe processes it, Moshe Rabbeinu took it from the realm of utter, utter ain't self, utter unknowability, and transported it into the world of human intelligence. He can do it because of the quality of his neshama. He can make that bridge. And then when he gave it over to us, when we are reading the Torah, but here's what's happening. When Moshe is bringing it from that state to that state, it's not being diluted. That's the point. He's capturing the divine light of it as is, and yet formulating it into human form. So now he's capturing in Torah what is really divine. And then when he's passing it on to us, 
even though it's now passed to us in human ter- terminology and in humanly comprehensible ideas, when we are grasping these ideas which seem human to us, they are really undiluted divinity. Pure godliness, not diluted, as is. So the channeling down into Moshe's mind doesn't diminish. It, 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 it's, it's brought down into human thinking without the diminishment. Now, that's the book of Mishnah Torah. So then we might say, oh, okay. So that's Mishnah Torah, but what's with the rest of... So you might say, okay, so then we should only be learning Mishnah Torah because when we're learning Bereshish, Shemois, Vayikra, Bamidbar, we are learning words that we have absolutely no grasp of what we're learning because it's utterly divine. It's only Mishnah Torah that what? That we're, that, that we're learning something, that we're able to, we're able to tap into the, the full meaning of it even though we're not necessarily understanding the full meaning, but it's within our understanding lies the deeper meaning. We can say that in what? Only in Mishnah Torah. But think about it. What did Moshe do in Mishnah Torah? In Mishnah Torah, he reviewed the past four books. Since Moshe Rabbeinu is reviewing the past four, few books, he's making the, the, the first four books of Torah that did not get funneled into the funnel like, like Mishnah Torah, that did not become part of Moshe's mind, but remained purely in its godly state and transmitted down, he, because Moshe Rabbeinu reviewed in Mishnah Torah the, those, those Svarim in Torah as well, so now when we study the rest of the Torah, we're also able to grasp it and understand. And the impossible happens. What's the impossible? The human mind and the divine mind are merging together, becoming one. When you're studying Torah, it's God's intellect and your intellect. And your intelligence, because it's your intelligence, isn't in any way lessening the divine intelligence. And that's because we have Sefer Mishnah Torah. And that's what we'll also understand. We'll go back for a moment. We said earlier that in Mishnah Torah we can, we can read and derive things when one, say, one parsha is next to the other parsha. We can derive why this is stated next to and we can. We can't do it in the rest. Because in the rest of the Torah, as we said earlier, inherently it never descended, in, it never descended into Moshe's mind. In and it of itself. It was passed down to us. Moshe was like the pen. It passed down to us. Therefore, even though the Shlach HaKadosh says, it's very important, the Shlach HaKadosh says that the, you can't say chas, I mentioned before the words that the rest of the Torah, it's random. The, 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 it's not by, written by chronological order, it's random, why one? Chas of Shal, not random. It's the most perfect science. It's perfect with the highest level of perfection. It's the highest discipline. It's the highest wisdom possible. Everything is accurate, accurate of, ac- of accuracy. But it's a type of perfection that is utterly divine. It's an order. The order of the way it's written is on a divine scale. Though it's not made for human minds to speculate and to try to figure out why God put one next to the other. Because it's outside of human reasoning. And therefore we can't do it. Why only regarding smuchen? I'm not sure. Why other things we could investigate on this. But at least in regard to this idea of why one parsha stated next to the other parsha, let's not try to apply human thinking. Like I love these Bible critics. Schmendrick what you are, a Bible critic. He's a ganze versteher on the Bible. You're dealing with the Bible. You're dealing with God's will. That's the problem. When, see, that's why when the, when the Torah came to the non-Jews, it was considered a very sad day. Why? Because they're going to come and take it with their grub, with 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 with, with fagrepte, you know, with, with with coarseness. A yid understands you're not a Bible critic. <laughs> you're talking about the, the Eberster's wisdom, so you can't come and give your human thinking and rationality why one thing is next to the other. It's utterly gedlich. It's godly. In Sefer Mishnah Torah, once it's processed through Moshe's mind, so Moshe did, he's giving it, you can already begin to conceive an order of what Moshe Rabbeinu's order is to figure out the the, the, the. But again, once Mishnah Torah was delivered to us, 
it enabled us for the rest of the Torah also that we're able to process it and understand it. And when we understand it, we're not taking the tail end of it. We're actually absorbing the whole thing. Even though we might not be getting consciously the whole thing, we're actually, at least in our neshama, we're absorbing the whole thing. So now what comes out is a really, really astounding thing. Something that is absolutely, that is a, uh, an oxymoron. Something that is impossible. On the one hand, you're learning Torah, and we say so much that you understand the Torah, and we say the Torah is ours. So much it says that a person can learn Torah a lot. We say, but Torah in his Torah he toils day and night. So we say that um, Torah delay, Torah becomes a person's. When a person learns Torah a lot, he's able to make it his or hers. It becomes theirs. So much so that a Talmud Chacham a, a Torah scholar can forgo on their honor. If you honor, we're supposed to honor a Talmud Chacham, a scholar. If the scholar says, I am Mochel, you don't have to stand up for me, then you don't have to. Why? But how is he allowed to do it? It's not his, you're not honoring him, you're honoring God. So the Gemara answers that when Torah becomes his, that means the Torah becomes ours. But at the same time, what are we saying? It's ours, completely ours, but at the same time, it's utterly divine. And this doesn't make any sense. How can it be completely godly? Godly means infinite. And how can it be yours? And at the same time, be yours and Hashem's. You're talking about your, a human finite mind is unified with an infinite idea from an infinite mind. And that's simultaneously. It's both human and, and therefore defined. It's very definable. That's what you're doing in yeshiva all day. You're defining concepts, understanding it really well. If you're not understanding it, you're not really learning Torah. You're understanding it and fully ab absorbing it, but yet at the same time, it's infinitely, it's infinite, it's an infinite concept. And it's there in your mind. Doesn't make any, How can it be both infinite and finite at the same time? And the answer is, here's the secret. <clears throat> it's all rooted in the fact that this is the fifth book. It's the fifth book, Sefer Devar. Last week we spoke about the Chiddush of number five. In God's name, there is Yud, K, Vav, K, four letters. But on top of the Yud, there is a little thorn. And the, the thorn on top of the Yud, a little crown, a little, that's pointing upward. So it's explained. That the four letters of God's name correspond to God's manifestation on four levels. Four worlds, four elements, four, um, four different sp types of uh, life in this world. I mean, four is in many levels, but mainly four worlds. And also the ten sefirot, which are divided into four different categories. And what is the, what is the, what is the little thorn on the top? The little thorn on the top is indicating the Ein Sof, the infinite. God's undefined, He's not defined by anything. Or even deeper than that, it's not an expression of God as God expresses Himself. It's the Abishter Himself. The fifth dimension represents God's essence. Hashem as He truly is. The Abishter as He truly is transcends the finite and equally transcends the infinite. Because Hashem is utterly not defined by any type of definition whatsoever, so from His very essence can come this impossibility. From the expressed levels of Hashem, where Hashem is already expressing Himself as a magnificent, infinite being, then you have an option, either or. On that level, even on the highest levels of divine expression, it has a certain get there. It has, because it's expression, it has a certain definition. It's defined with some type of a definition. And its definition, therefore, is... So therefore, the lim, it limitate, so to speak, the limitation that it has is as follows. That what we said earlier. Either it's exposed as it is, but if it's exposed as it is, it's, it's not diminished. 
we spoke earlier, thing, it's being trans, transmitted as is without any diminishment. But on the other, but if that's the case, we can't absorb it. The recipient can't absorb it. It will remain. It will be totally above our heads. Or if you want it to be absorbed, what do you have to do? You have to diminish it. You have to contract it. You have to dilute it. So you have to pass it through, as we spoke earlier, a middleman, and that middleman is going to change it, and its change is going to be a real change, and that's going to be a dilute, diluted already. You're not getting the essence. It's either or, because it's limited. From Hashem Himself, as He has no definitions whatsoever, these two things can happen together. He can give you the full truth, the full light, the full unadulterated, undiminished, unedited version, so to speak, of his, of his wisdom. Pass it down. It becomes absorbed and comprehended. And at the same time that it's your mind, it's God's mind. And, and you're wondering, it, it, you can't fathom, this is impossible. But that's the whole point. That he has no definitions whatsoever and he can do the impossible. So Dafka Mishneh Torah, the last book of Torah, is rooted not in the expressions of God, but in the very, very essence of the Eberster himself. That's the fifth book. That's Mishneh Torah. Higher, than, higher even than all the other four books. Well this, we'll just wrap it up, we'll go back to there is another element in human experience, other than in Mishneh Torah, understanding of Torah, where you have this impossibility of something being both you and God, and it's both truly you and truly Hashem. And what is that? That is in the concept of tshuva. When a person does tshuva, it says an amazing thing. Generally, when we are being good Jews and we're learning Torah and we're doing mitzvahs, we are channeled, we are hooked up to God. Every mitzvah is another pipeline. It's another transmitter of the divine into our neshama. We know that our soul is made up of 613 strands, 613 spiritual cables, and through those spiritual cables, God's light flows to us through the 613 mitzvahs. Therefore, and a person who's really observant, like a tzaddik, who's really observant, doesn't break that bond, will experience certain divine intuition in their life. And that's why they have Ruach HaKodesh, and they have deeper inspiration, and they're being constantly pushed towards higher achievements. Why? Because the, the God is constantly coaxing them on. Why? Because they're constantly connected. So when there is extra flow from the divine, it inspires them. Once a person, however, becomes lax and negligent, or even worse than that, intentionally violates what happens of the commandments and does sins, he begins to create blockages. The more blockages you make, the more disconnected you become. Now, if a person becomes totally sinful, or if a person was born in, a, in, in an environment where they have absolutely no communication with any mitzvahs, they didn't learn Torah, don't do any mitzvahs, their parents didn't keep the laws of bringing a, whole, a soul into this world according to Torah. So they're born and they're living in a complete state of disconnect. So the question is, where does that person come and do tshuva? How are they doing tshuva? A person who has no visible, outright connection and communication with the divine, why suddenly do they have this aching burning that they want to connect? What's that? Where is it coming from? They're disconnected. So it says an interesting thing. That's the whole beauty of tshuva. That's why God loves tshuva so much because it's the real, in a mitzvah that you're inspired to do, it's not only you. God, God inspired you. He's constantly communicating. He's constantly inspiring. But, but in tshuva, when you're already disconnected, so you have no Wi-Fi coming to you. There's nothing. It's like being in a dark, dark, ten, ten, ten um, a uh, ten-story parking lot, and all the way, all the way on the bottom, there's no Wi-Fi coming through. So where's the inspiration coming from? No one can call you. No one can reach you. It has to come from you. So that's what's so beautiful about Shuva. It's really us. But on the other hand, we know that we can't do anything unless it's coming from Hashem. So how, so how does it work? Is it coming from Hashem? No, it's not. It's us. That's the beauty of Shuva. So it says an interesting thing. The tzaddik is experiencing constant stimulation from the more revealed 
elements of God that God com- is projected. He projects himself from Hashem's outer spherot and attributes and spiritual lights that are in the higher world. That's what's coaxing the tzaddik. The tzaddik feels it and that's why he's inspired for greater achievement and greater mitzvahs and so on and so forth. The balchuva is also being stimulated by God. But his stimulation is coming from the inner, 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 inner essence of the essence of the essence of Hashem Himself, of the deepest, most concealed, hidden place. That hidden, private, most inner point place cannot stimulate outside because it's so private, deep inside. It's like the deepest, most inner, private feeling in me. You're gonna, you're not gonna be, you're gonna be completely unaware of it. It's not gonna touch you. Well, it is gonna touch you if you are of my essence. If you are of my essence, then you can know even something that I'm not telling anybody, you can sense it. Sometimes, you know, people that are very deeply connected can sense things that are just so impossible from being... Why? Even though there's no outside expression, no outside stimulation at all, because they're of one essence. Since the neshama is an essence, one with the essence of Hashem, not the outer expressions, Therefore, the essential, unexpressed, private, chapter private stimulation in God is provoking the neshama, but provoking the neshama in a non-provocative way. So when the neshama is getting excited to do tshuva, it's the neshama on its own doing it. It's you, completely you, but it's also the abish there. It's human and divine at the same time because you, there's no way that this is communicated. It's not communicated. Why do, you, why do I feel something that's not communicated? Oh, well, because I'm really one with you. So in tshuva, you have the same idea that we spoke about in Torah, in Mishnah Torah, that it can be your understanding and God's understanding. Here it's your inspiration and the Eibishter at the same time because it's coming from such an inner essential place that's not, an ex, that's not expressed. That's what the Rebbe, the Lubav, the Lubav, the Rebbe says on this Indian of Tshuva and on Mishnah Torah. And that's the idea why Ela Advarim is both Teichacha rebuke. Because the whole idea of rebuke is Tshuva. That's the idea of rebuke. Tshuva and Mishnah Torah both have the quality of being, because they're both coming from the essence of Hashem, they have the quality that it can be completely us and completely Hashem at the same time. It's not related to what we call giluyim, to the outer expressions of God. It's related to the essence of the essence. And the Rebbe concludes, and I'm going to say something really interesting. He says that that's the, also the reason of Hasidus coming to the world right before Mashiach comes. Because just like Mishneh Torah was said right before the Jewish people have to go into Eretz Yisrael, as an introduction to Eretz Yisrael, Mishneh Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu said the last 40 days in the Midbar, before they were launched, before they went to Eretz Yisrael. So similar to that is Hasidus, he says. Hasidus is here because we're ready to go into Eretz Yisrael again, this time forever with Mashiach Tzadkenu. So as an introduction to that came Torah Sa Hasidus. The teachings of Hasidus have an interesting quality. On the one hand, it's understandable. You can study it, you can learn it with your mind. Ideas that you can learn. On the other hand, what are you learning about? You're learning pure divinity. Hasidus is elokus. It's pure. Within Torah itself, it, the subject is not even worldly things. The subject is the divine. And Hasidus is not, the, the, it's this panemius of the Torah. It's not changing when it's coming into our minds. We're learning it with our human thick brains and we're understanding it and when it becomes human understandable, uh, human comprehension, it's not in any way changed from its pure divine MS and truth. Why is that? Again, because Hasidus is the fifth dimension of Torah. It's Yechida of the Torah. It's Pshat, Remez, Drush and Sod. And Hasidus is the secrets of the secret, which is the essence. That's why Hasidus awakens the essence of Jews and the Shamas. That's why Hasidus is at the forefront of the tshuva movement, because it touches the essence of the Jewish soul. Why? Because it's coming from the essence. And, Hasid, and it's a preparation for going into Eretz Yisrael. And that's the secret of Mishneh Torah. May we merit already 
to realize and see this fusion, this oneness between us and Hashem and the coming of Mashiach, let it be now.